Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome, welcome. Uh, my name is Rennie. I'm a program assistant here at the Fine Arts Work Center. Um, most of you, oh, thanks, David. That's a good idea. A little taller than most. Uh, most of you are here because you are participating in one of our workshops this week. Um, but for those who aren't, Every, for nine weeks every summer, the Work Center hosts week-long open enrollment, visual arts, and writing workshops. Um, if anyone here is interested in learning more, you can ask me or any of the staff who are here hanging around. David is here, and Sarah is in the back um, after the event, and we'll tell you all about the offerings this summer. Um, one of our favorite parts of our summer programs is that every week, our fabulous faculty mesmerize our audiences with presentations and talks. Tonight we're going to hear from two faculty members, writers Julia Phillips and Andrea Lawler will both read from their work, which will be followed by a Q&A with the audience. Before we begin, a little bit of housekeeping and other items of interest. Andrea and Julia will have their books for sale uh, and for signing after the event. The books are for purchase in the back of the room and they'll sign books up front here at this table. Other books by this year's faculty are also for sale in the back, as well as some Fine Arts Work Center merch. So feel free to check it out. Um, also, the new Hudson D. Walker Gallery will be open after the event. It's just through the, that door on the left, or your right. Uh, right now, we're showing Density's Glitch, which features work by former Fine Arts Work Center fellows. Um, and the proceeds of all work sold will go to support Work Center programs, so be sure to check it out after the event. Uh, restrooms are located down the hall. And finally, please turn off your cell phones or turn them to silent, if you will. So we'll begin with Julia Phillips, who's teaching a course this week called Structuring Your Story. This is Julia's first time teaching at the Work Center, but she did a reading here back in early 2020 from her internationally best-selling novel, Disappearing Earth, which was a finalist for the National Book Award. A Fulbright Fellow, Phillips has written for the New York Times, The Atlantic, and the Paris Review. The New York Times has called her work nearly flawless and a superb debut, which, while NPR praised Russian set Disappearing Earth as coming closer in spirit to great American literature than most of the fiction set within US borders. Fans of her writing describe it as spellbinding and wonderfully imagined. She teaches at the Randolph College MFA program and lives in Brooklyn. So please join me in welcoming Julia Phillips. Hi, everybody. How's that? Is that good? Okay. Hi. How, how wonderful to be with you this week and tonight uh, and to be with Andrea here. I'm gonna read a little bit from that, that novel that was just so kindly described. I, I didn't recognize any of those descriptions and so that was very exciting for me. <laughs> um, just from the beginning, I'm gonna read two short excerpts. I'll tell you and I'm skipping ahead. Sophia Sandals Off was standing at the water's edge the bay snuck up to swallow her toes, gray salt water over bright skin. Don't go out any farther, Aliona said. The water receded. Aliona could see under her sister's feet, the pebbles breaking the curves of Sophia's arches, the sweep of grit left by little waves. Sophia bent to roll up her pant legs and her ponytail flipped over the top of her head. Her calves showed flaking streaks of blood from scratch mosquito bites. Aliona knew from the firm line of her sister's spine that Sophia was refusing to listen. You better not, Aliona said. Sophia stood to face the water. It was calm, barely touched by ripples that made the bay look like a sheet of hammered tin. The current got stronger as it pulled into the Pacific, leaving Russia behind for open ocean. But here it was domesticated. It belonged to them. Hands propped on narrow hips, Sophia surveyed it, the width of the bay, the mountains on the horizon, the white lights of the military installation on the opposite shore. The gravel under the sisters was made of chips from bigger stones. Aliona leaned against a block the size of a hiking backpack, and a meter behind her was the crumbling cliff face of St. Nicholas Hill. 
water on one side, rock wall on the other. They had walked along the coast this afternoon until they found this patch, free of bottles or feathers, to settle. When seagulls landed nearby, Aliona chased them away with a wave of her arm. The whole summer had been cool, drizzly, but this August afternoon was warm enough to wear short sleeves. Sophia took a step out, and her heel went under. Aliona sat up. Soph, I said no. Her sister backed up. A gull flew over. Why do you have to be such a brat? I'm not. You are. You always are. No, Sophia said, turning around. Her tipped up eyes, thin lips, sharp jaw, even the point of her nose annoyed Aliona. At eight years old, Sophia still looked six. Aliona, three years older, was short for her age, but Sophia was tiny all over, from waist to wrists, and sometimes acted like a kindergartner. She kept a row of stuffed animals at the foot of her bed, played pretend that she was a world-famous ballerina, couldn't fall asleep at night if she caught even one scene of a horror movie on the TV. Their mother indulged her. Being born second had given Sophia the privilege of staying a baby all her life. Gaze fixed on a spot on the cliff far above Aliona's head, Sophia lifted one foot out of the water, pointed wet toes, and raised her arms to fifth position. She tipped and caught herself. Aliona shifted her seat on the stones. Their mother always tried to get Aliona to take her sister along to classmates' apartments, but these little misdeeds were exactly why she would not. Instead, they had spent their summer vacation alone with each other. While Sophia balanced, Aliona looked along the shore. A man was picking his way over the rocks. Someone's coming, Aliona said. Her sister splashed one leg down and lifted the other. Sophia might not care who saw her act like an idiot, but Aliona, her forced companion, did. Stop, Aliona said, more loudly, heating up in her mouth. Stop. Sophia stopped. I'm going to skip forward a little bit. They end up eat, meeting that man on the path, and he has sprained his ankle. So they help him back to his car. So the bit I'm gonna read now is, is from that walk, starting there. The path opened up to the center, the stone-covered beach, families on the benches, gray birds flapping their wings over hot dog buns and shipped to shore cranes extending their long bare necks. This, I'm thinking about the P-Town Pier as I read this. <laughs> Sophia had stopped to wait for them. The bulk of the hill was behind. Are you okay? Aliona asked the man. He pointed to their right. We're almost there. To the parking lot? Nodded. He limped along behind the food stands, generators chugging exhaust around his knees. The sisters followed. An older boy in a fitted cap skateboarded past the fronts of the stands, and Aliona looked forward in shame to be saddled with her little sister, to be trailing behind a weak stranger. She wanted to get home already. Taking Sophia's hand, she caught up with the man. What's your name, he asked. Aliona. Alyonka, would you take my keys? He shook them out of his pants pocket and unlock the car door. I can do it, said Sophia. They were already at the crescent-shaped lot on the other side of the hill. He gave the key ring to the smaller girl. It's the black one there, the surf. Sophia skipped forward and opened the driver's side. He got in, exhaling as he sat. She held onto the door handle. The side panel's flawless paint reflected her body, dressed in purple cotton and rolled khaki. How does it feel, she asked. He shook his head. You girls really helped me. Can you drive, Aliona said. Yes. You're going where now? Home. Where's that? Gorizont. I'll take you, he said. Get in. Sophia let go of the door. Aliona looked across the street at the bus stop. A bus would take them more than half an hour, while in a car, they'd be home in 10 minutes. The man had started his engine. He waited for their answer. Sophia was already peering into the back seat. Aliona, as the older sister, took her time. She spent a few seconds weighing the city bus, its starting and stopping, its heaving noises, the smell of other people's sweat, against this offer, his softness, his bad ankle, his boyish face. How easy it would be to be driven. The car would get them home quickly enough for a snack before their evening meal. This would just be another daytime thrill, a summer break disobedience to be kept between her and Sophia. Thank you, Aliona said. She went around the front and climbed into the passenger seat, warm from the sun. Its leather was soft as a lap underneath her. A cross-shaped icon was fixed to the face of the glove compartment. 
If only the skateboarder could see her now, sitting in the front seat of a big car. Sophia slid into the row behind. A few parking spots away, a woman let a white dog out of the back of a van for a walk. Where to, he asked. Academica Koroleva, 31. He signaled and rolled out of the lot. A pack of cigarettes slid across the top of the dashboard. His car smelled of soap, tobacco, faint gasoline. The woman and her dog were crossing the line of food stands. Does it hurt, Sophia said. I'm better already, thanks to you. He merged into traffic. The sidewalks were clotted by local teenagers wearing neon and cruise ship tourists posing for pictures. As the center of the only city on the peninsula, this was the first stop for Kamchatka summer visitors. They were rushed from their boat or plane to see the bay, then rushed away beyond city limits to hike or raft or hunt in the empty wilderness. A trunk honked. People kept stepping out into the crosswalk. The light changed, and then their car was free. From the passenger seat, Aliona took the man's features apart. A wide nose and a mouth underneath that matched. Short brown eyelashes, round chin, his body looked carved out of fresh butter. He was too heavy, probably. That must be why he had stepped clumsily on the shore. Do you have a girlfriend? asked Sophia. He laughed and shifted gears, accelerating up a hill. The car hummed underneath them. The bay drew away behind. No, I don't. And you're not married? Nope. He lifted his hand, fingers spread to show. Sophia said, I saw already. Clever thing, he said. How old are you? Eight. He glanced at her in the rearview mirror. And you're also not married, am I right? Sophia giggled. Aliona turned to watch the road. His car was taller than their mother's sedan. She could look down on roof racks and along the pink lines of driver's arms. People were sunburned after this one day of good weather. Can I put the window down, she asked. I prefer the air conditioning. Straight through this intersection? Yes, please. The trees along the sidewalks were fat and green from this rainy summer. They passed ragged billboards on their left and concrete paneled apartment buildings on their right. Here, Aliona said. Here. Oh, she twisted in her seat. You missed the turn. You missed the turn, Sophia said from the back. I want to take you to my place first, the man said. I need a little more help. Thank you. That was scary the whole way through. <laughs> OK, now we'll hear from Andrea Lawler, who's teaching a course this week called Queer Transfabulism, Writing the Mythic from the Margins. This is Andrea's first time teaching here at the Work Center, but certainly not the last. Andrea is the author of Paul Takes the Form of a Mortal Girl, a 2018 finalist for the Lambda Literary and CLMP Firecracker Awards, and the poetry chapbook Position Papers. Their writing has appeared in literary journals, including Plowshares, Mother, The Millions, The Brooklyn Rail, and Encyclopedia Volume 2. They've been awarded fellowships by Lambda Literary and Radar Labs. Lawler was educated at the University of Iowa, Temple University, and the University of Massachusetts at Amherst's MFA program for poets and writers. They teach writing at Mount Holyoke College. Their fun, fun and frequently hilarious work has been described as an intriguing middle ground that opens space to discuss the ways in which queer stories are told. And the White Review speculated that Lawler is heralding a new wave of trans and non-binary writing that engages with trans theory without ignoring the ways in which their characters break down gender binaries. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Andrea Lawler. Thank you so much for that um, lovely introduction and very hard to follow that extremely intense and terrifying <laughs> passage. Julia, I'm really excited to be here with all of you and to read with Julia. Am I doing a lot of reverb? OK, a little bit. <laughs> Sorry, I'll work on that. Um, so I'm going to read. Has, is this better? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So much better. <laughs> wow, OK. I haven't been in like in the world that much, you know. I, like forget how to use a microphone. So I'm gonna read a little bit from the middle of this book um, because I'm gonna read a Provincetown section because we're in Provincetown, right? So what you need to know is that it's um, 
1990, well, maybe 1994 in this section, and Paul is a shapeshifter. And he's followed Diane, who he met at Michigan, to Provincetown. Okay, that's a thing that people do. <laughs> Paul sat back deep in the couch in his New Year's outfit, intentionally dressed down to signal that New Year's Eve was for amateurs, watching all these cool Provincetown girls pass around an elaborate hand-blown glass bong in preparation for going dancing. Another car full of shockingly attractive, disheveled girls arrived from New York, corduroy clad and brandishing bottles of Rene Junot. From what he could make out, the new arrivals either currently attended or had recently graduated from Wesleyan and were engaged in an unspoken coolness battle with the evergreen girls. A strapping androgynous Britishy girl, Wesleyan, slid Betty Severe's tomboy into the CD player and was seen and raised one by a girl with a homemade bowl cut and a Kim Wilde cassette, Evergreen. <laughs> Paul didn't know where to look. Diane brought him a Flintstones jelly glass of wine, which he sipped happily, relishing the protective weight of her arm over his shoulder. The rival gangs all turned for approval to Gertie, the townie sous chef who'd rented the house cheaply for the winter and whom everybody else had met at Michigan. Gertie herself didn't engage in the coolness off. Instead, holding forth about her plans to open her own restaurant that summer, or maybe the following summer, all the while eyeing the preening dancers. She was clearly the power broker, a little older than the rest, a working class butch fox in the college girl hen house. Paul felt annoyed that she hadn't flirted with him yet. He was a college girl, she thought, but he knew those Wesleyan girls had something he would never have. Diane didn't have whatever it was either, a trust fund, Paul thought, or maybe a childhood spent in Westchester. But she had something else, something different from everyone in the room, something different from other girls. Diane was as fascinatingly blank as any man and as frustrating, a shiny reflective surface and Paul a magpie. The mystery of her cheeks, her dimples ever shocking when she'd smile at him from across the bed or table. Jane had been the first person to explain to Paul about dimples. It was a category of desirable attribute he hadn't before considered, but now he saw dimples everywhere, and what were her eyes, chocolate syrup? Paul squirmed and shifted until the crotch seam of his cords pressed pleasurably against the soft triangle of his cotton panties. Diane had recently brought, bought a pack of tidy whiteies, and he saw the yellow and blue striped waistband sneaking out of her work pants. What was she? She was girlish, but not womanly. She was an androgyne off the left bank, her choppy, blunt cut like a waspy little girl or a Dutch man. Her signature red hooded sweatshirt zipped all the way up under her black pleather motorcycle jacket. Her huddled concentration, her fingers in her mouth as she read, her brow furrowed over what? What were her emotions? Did she have emotions? Diane was combat rock. She was a song building. She was, what was that? A fuzz box. She was Albertine a traffic light turning red at twilight, a tiger's paw, a marble fawn in a pocket garden, a whiskey sour. Did Paul love Diane for her looks? Yes. No, okay, yes. <laughs> but what did it mean to love her looks? He could see the contrary position, some family Thanksgiving, the suburban television magazine agonies, too big, not feminine, too big, messy, dirty, bovine, slow her jaw like a statuary angel, her ears poking through the sheaf of hair, her bangs in her eyes, her clavicle, new word, her broad features, her straight hips and hard small bumps of breasts and her frayed t-shirt, her melancholy blankness, her hidden stores of thought and pain. Paul stared at Diane, remembered the day he'd met her in the Michigan kitchen, tried to hold on to whatever first invited this compulsion to stare, tried to understand, to puzzle her out, to possess through figuring out to maintain, to plumb, to ensnare and study. What kind of creature was she? Dark, earth-smelling, a rustic, topsoil encrusted fingernails and all. The musk of her armpits at night, her red lips, the texture of rose petals, the hard muscle of her arms, the occasional gray hair he'd find, her, her eyelashes like tarantula's legs. She was Zeus's own sweet cow and his tender cupbearer at once. <laughs> placid, slow expanses of skin and what Paul knew to be called big boned. She was bigger than him as Polly or him as Paul, a few inches taller and wider. Her shoulders were broader than his. He'll stretch it, he thought helplessly when she'd borrowed his shirt that morning, but no, better, he'd sacrifice his shirts for her. 
he'd wear the stretched out shirt thinking Diane's body was here and I am now inside the space she left. I fit myself inside her shape. Is everybody coming to dinner? Gertie asked loudly, startling Paul out of his reverie. She gestured with a novelty red high heel phone. I have a table for 10, but they'll make room for a few more. At dinner, Paul and Diane sat squeezed together at the corner of a big table in the back room at Edwige, an expensive seeming restaurant upstairs from a pizza place. At least he'd save money if he had to eat vegetarian, he thought. Diane's vegetarian. <laughs> Two of Gertie's performer friends joined them, ordering martinis and generally lording it over the college girls. Paul had begun to work out the taxonomy of Provincetown. Should he say P-Town? He wasn't sure. <laughs> Performers seemed to occupy a stratum between tourists and townies. Weekender tourist, all summer tourist, short season worker, long season worker, year rounder worker, queer townie, fisherman townie, but he wasn't sure which one. The performers, a large butch lounge singer in a tuxedo and a glamorous femme comedian, a dead ringer for Sophia Loren, drank copiously but didn't eat in preparation for their late evening shows at The Crown and The Pied. Paul was careful to take in but not yet use the local patois. He still had newness to spend but wanted to transition easily and appropriately to authenticity when the time was right. Paul couldn't tell if the lounge singer and the comedian were together, but he could tell the lounge singer was checking him out. He moved his chair even closer to Diane and made a show of stealing olives off her plate. But the lounge singer had him in her sights and she fired. Honey child, she said in raspy drag queen sato voice, what is going on with you two pretty ladies? Who is the man in your little menage? Let daddy tell you what's what. Paul could feel Diane flinch. He cast about for a cutting retort, but before he could say anything, the comedian stepped in with a slow, elegant, but menacing full body turn in her chair. You leave those nice young people alone, Dinell, she said, southern honey dripping. They just want to be free. The lounge singer wasn't having it. Oh, please, she drawled. I'm just trying to mentor here, run a big brother, big sister program to let these children know they can do something besides each other's hair. You know me, I'm a walking public service announcement. The Wesleyan girls snickered, or the butch ones at any rate. The femmes knew what Diane was, Paul thought, knew what she and Paul were doing, even if Diane herself didn't. The waiter came to take more drink orders, and the conversation shifted to backstage drag drama. Saji said this, and Ryan Landry said that, and did you hear about Big Lil? And on and on. The Wesleyan girls knew everybody, had waited tables at Cafe Blase the previous summer. Paul didn't know any of the people being discussed, but enjoyed proximity to any kind of fame. Diane did not seem to be having fun, which worried him. He wanted to go dancing after and hoped this wouldn't ruin their night. The evergreen girls began to talk amongst themselves. Diane looked lost. Hey, said Paul, so what's the story with all the whale watching here and the coastal studies place? That seems a little fishy. <laughs> the lounge singer groaned and the Wesleyan girls ignored him, but the, com the comedian smiled generously at Paul. The lounge singer jumped in. The whale watches gather whale data for the center, she said and they keep straight people off the streets after we've taken their money. <laughs> no, said Diane, that's wrong. <laughs> really, said the lounge singer with a quick look of joy. I'm wrong? Yes, you're wrong, said Diane. The Coastal Studies Center attracts whales to protect them, like when they're beached or whatever. Those whale watches just spew their poison into the water. They don't help. That whole data gathering thing is just marketing bullshit. Oh, I see, said the lounge singer, an environmentalist. Of course, I bet you're from the West Coast, right? Well, what about the connections between the Coastal Studies Center and the secret Navy labs in Woods Hole? What do you say about that, huh? Didn't know about that, did you? <laughs> what a train wreck, Paul thought. Diana had gone into a sort of thrall state like that rabbit from Watership Down, and the lounge singer was jabbering at her relentlessly. He signaled the waiter for more drinks, though realistically he should save his money in case there was a cover. Fuck it, he thought. That's just a rumor, said Gertie. There's no military dolphins. Why do you people hate America? <laughs> Shouldn't we get going? Yes, cried the Wesleyan girls. LLZ. The waiter dropped the check on the table and the lounge singer grabbed it. 40 each should do it, she said. Paul felt a little sick. He looked at Diane, who also looked a little sick. So fucked up, he whispered, pulling two 20s out of his bra. I know, Diane whispered. Military dolphins, Jesus. They left in a pack, spilling into the bracing, oceanic night. The performers said their loud goodbyes and see you laters, and Gertie led the way to the A house, where they'd probably be the only girls. Everyone was very excited about this. There was a general air of transgression to the proceedings. 
Paul and Diane hung back a little, Paul chattering away and pointing out special features of the landscape as they passed. What kind of tree do you think that is? It looks extremely old. Or, look, a whole store devoted to men's underwear. Can you believe it? But he could tell Diane was still angry. When they arrived at the A house, which was actually, Paul noted, called the Atlantic house, so he was already seamlessly using the inside words, <laughs> Gertie got them all in for free. The A house looked like everything else in Provincetown, a stop on some rich person's historical landmark garden tour with rent boys and leather daddies instead of docents and butlers. <laughs> you want to see my card, Billy? Gertie said, flicking the bouncer's leather suspenders. You want to see my friend's cards? Friends of yours are friends of mine, Gertie, said the bouncer queenishly, but don't go telling Amos I'll let a bunch of underage girls in for you. Our little secret, said Gertie. She was really pulling out all the stops. Why did all the dykes in Provincetown sound like fags, Paul wondered. Inside was any gay bar Paul had ever been in, with a lower ceiling and redder light. He felt like he was at a gay rave in Narnia. <laughs> Instead of heading to the bar, Diane pulled him decisively into a corner, next to a giant speaker pulsing out bass. She pushed him up against the wall, kissing and grinding on him so fiercely he forgot everything but his happiness. They were almost hidden from view, just visible enough to be exciting. Diane was surprising. Every day she did something he didn't expect. He would have thought she'd be agonizing over that stupid lounge singer or moping, not taking Paul exactly as he wanted to be taken. He pushed his wet pussy against her thigh, rubbing himself up and down her like an animal or an unselfconscious teenager. He wanted what he wanted, and he was getting it, to be girls together with this hot tomboy girl, a do-over. Right before he came, Diane pulled away and watched him tremble. She maybe really was a top, he thought. At that moment, he would have done anything she'd asked. Best to nip that in the bud. <laughs> wow. Thank you, Andrea. That was phenomenal. Um, <laughs> now we're going to do a little Q&A. Um, so I can make sure this is on. Hello. Yes, here we are. So I'll let you guys pass that back and forth. Are they, do, does it, and I'll, you guys just do it. And any questions for our readers tonight? Just stick your hand up and let's have some fun. Yeah, we need, we need you guys to just do it. What were you both most scared about getting wrong? I mean, both of you are dealing with very specific communities, um, Russian Arctic or Provincetown. Where were the points where you were like, eh, this is scary. Um, I think I'm more aware of them in retrospect than I was at the time. I, uh, when I started this project, I, it's, I'm, it's written by an outsider about characters who are insiders to a place. Um, like, there's not an American character visiting Russia in my book. They're all Russians. And so I knew everything was going to be wrong. Uh, and I kind of just took that. I found that to be, in the writing at the time, I found that to be liberating and not scary. I thought, well, I'm just going to get it all wrong. I'm just going to have to do my best um, and fact check it and as much as I can and ask people to read it and research it, but know that it's going to be starting from a place of getting it wrong. Um, and so that, in a way, was, uh, yeah, liberating, freeing in the writing, because I knew that the exercise was not to, um, I, knew, I knew that the exercise was not predicated on my rightness. Uh, that said, I don't think I had a robust sense of, of the publication process or the, ex I don't think I had a clear sense that after I wrote it, then I would one day have the opportunity to be here speaking about it from a place of authority. This, this thing I made up in my head that the whole time I was doing it, I said, oh, this is gonna be all wrong. Uh, and that's a whole different vibe. And I have to say that makes me a little more informed going forward about what I am doing and how I'm approaching it. Informed in what way? I guess time will tell. Only in retrospect do I understand. What did you get wrong? Like, what did you well, about? Yeah, what, um, well, I, can you hear me on this? Yeah, okay, good. Uh, I think, you know, writing thinly veiled autobiographical fiction 
is one way to sort of dodge that. Um, and I think, you know, it's kind of interesting. Um, I, I started what became this book in probably 2002. And then you know, I put it away for a while. And then, but when I was starting in 2002, it was sort of like the, you know, I was writing thinly veiled autobiographical fiction about the recent past. And by the time it became a book in the world in 2017, um, my uh, thesis director, or one of the people on my thesis committee uh, at UMass in, well, in, in 2012, said, um, wow, Andrea, you got the, you know, for, you got all the historical details really right. And I was like, Jed, that's not historical fiction. Um, but then I had to kind of come to terms with, you know, okay, historical fiction. So I think for me, one of the things I ended up doing was a lot of, um, once I realized actually after that conversation that what I was writing was becoming historical fiction, I began to make that a constraint going forward. So I tried to keep things I, I sort of, you have to put some limits, right? So I was like, okay, it's gonna, you know, we're gonna go up to the end, like it's gonna end in like 1995, right? So what, what is it possible for a character from this, um, you know, uh, historical location, the subjectivity to think or say? What kind of language is it possible for this character to use? How can this character understand um, you know, life uh, at this moment in history. And so that was actually really helpful. So there's plenty of language in the book that um, I might not use now. Um, I use he, him throughout the book for Paul. They, them wasn't a viable, um, wasn't really used in the same way in the early night. It wasn't used in this way that um, some of us like me use it now. Um, but there was also, so there was something like liberating about sort of having that constraint um, but I also had to fact check my own memory because I think when you're writing something that's based on your own experience, there's a sort of sense of like, I'm an authority, it's my experience. But you know, I had to do a lot of, um, I definitely used some, some Google Earth. Um, I, you know, I, I talked to a lot of people, like I'd spent a number of long seasons in Provincetown, but I had to like check with other people who'd been there at the same time. Like, was that, was, did we open that year? You know, like, stuff like that. And um, was it we above the, you know, and, and going back now, I'm like, well, it's cool I wrote it all down because I don't remember any of that now. <laughs> so, yeah, I think a lot of uh, fact-checking. Other questions for us? Ask us anything. It's like Reddit. Yeah. <laughs> it's not like Reddit. Don't ask us. <laughs> I have a question for you, actually. Oh, all right. <laughs> which, we're, going like that. we're going like that. Um, which is that thinly veiled autobiographical novels, um, I find uh, that the closer the character is to me, the harder it is for me to see them and uh, write them because I, fear actually like starts to intercede a lot more. And that fiction writing, I, as long as I tell myself it's something else, even if it really is me, I tell myself it's somebody else who's quite not me, and then I find it easier. And I wonder how you do what you've done, especially working on a long project, especially as the you that you are writing about recedes into the distance. Like, do you have more or less clarity at certain times? Do you feel fearful when you come to that character? How do you, how do, you do it? Andrea, how? <laughs> Easy question. I'm going to get you back. <laughs> um, but no, I, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I think... For me, um, I don't. I I don't know that fear was a dominant experience for me in in writing. I mean, maybe fear of not finishing yeah. something I'd started. So I sort of like I'm extremely um, dogged, but it is also difficult for me to finish things. Triple fire, double Aries. We went through this in my workshop. I like to start things, hard to finish. But so for me, it was really important to finish. And uh, one of the things that became sort of interesting to me um, was, yeah, like I changed a lot. Like the person I was in the early 90s is very different from the sort of like normcore dad that um, I currently seem to be, which is, uh, you know, really like a shocking thing to be 
sort of like, I have this really filthy book about partying. And um, I was on a Zoom call uh, before the pandemic. I was doing a Zoom visit to a class. Um, you know, maybe in like 2018, we did Zoom then, that's weird. But um, Chuggy, my kid came in and was like, you know, Baba, read, read to me. And I was like, honey, I'm doing a work thing, you know? And um, I was like, well, I guess I can't read from the book. So there's these fairy tale sections in the book. So I ended up having the kid on my lap reading the fairy tale sections. And my kid now thinks my book is a book of fairy tales. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, that's fine, because you're never gonna read it. So just <laughs> keep that in your, but it's a very strange thing. You know, like I started it way before there was any thought of a, anyway, so. Um, yeah, and, and you know, there's, it's sort of like, I do feel very different from that person who lived similarly to this character. Um, I do feel like maybe this is just having like grown up and hopefully thrown off some of the Catholicism that I was raised with. Um, I feel like an imperative to sort of like confess all my flaws. Mm -hmm. So I, I definitely try to like give Paul like as, you know, all my flaws and maybe some more just for fun. Um, <laughs> But, but definitely, I'm you know deeply flawed in this way too. Yeah. So I think, like I don't know if it, there's sort of like a, it's more um, a relief yeah. to put it down yeah. than a fear yeah. of exposure. But maybe that is that sounds really Catholic. Okay, um, I want to hear more about, and I'm gonna just throw it back to you. You know, anytime anyone. Has no, no, this is this is called turnabout is fair play. <laughs> Um, what brought you to Russia? Like, what brought you to write this book? Thank you for asking. It's a very serious literary answer, and I'm glad to share it with this group of artists. When I was 12 years old, I had a crush on a Russian-American camp counselor. I thought he was extremely hot. Uh, I immediately lost touch with that person. I don't know if I was ever in touch with that person. I was mostly just, like, staring from the sides of a dance, weeping while Here's to the Night played by Eve Six. Um, I don't know if you remember that song, a classic of <laughs> summer camp dances. But, um, but after that, I was like, Russian language seems like, for some reason, very hot. And then, and then I was like, uh, okay, Russian history is like very interesting and captivating. And then I was like, well, Russian literature, I want to be a writer. Like, wow, Russian literature. And I kind of became a Russophile uh, as a teenager. So then I studied Russian in college, and I was very into it. And um, by the time I went to Kamchatka for the first time, which is where the book is set in 2011, I would say I was kind of passionately in love with this place, um, this particular place. Really like, you know, like heart, heart sick for this place. And I ended up spending a, maybe a little over a year there, a year and a half there. Um, and then writing the book helped me move through that philia, you know, help me, helped me um, process that love and find a place for it that was less passionate, I would say, and more, maybe had more clarity. But it was a long, long honeymoon period with Russia. Um, and now I think perhaps I will never go to Russia again. I, I don't know if, any, you know, I think perhaps... Um, that door is closed, which is a strange thing. I mean, I guess we all have that, right? Like things that consume us and that flare us up and then that, for one reason or another, um, time or invasions uh, burn out. Um, but yeah, Russia is no longer, I think, I, Kamchatka remains, if you ever find yourself in Kamchatka for some reason, it I think is one of the most beautiful places in the whole world. Spectacular and interesting place, certainly needs your, your tourist dollars with its current economy, but, um, but I don't know if we'll ever go there. What are you guys working on now? I think I, what, what are you guys working on now? Just curious. I'm working on a fairy tale. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm working on a, a novel, a new novel that is, I don't know if you ever read the Grimm's Brothers fairy tale, Rose Red and Snow White, or Snow White and Rose Red, I think it is. It's about two sisters and a bear, a grizzly bear comes into his house, their house and it turns out that he's an enchanted prince. Um, they take care of him, they like roll on the floor with him and, and do all sorts of stuff, all sorts of stuff with that bear. Uh, <laughs> and then at the end, he turns into a, a 
wonderful man, and one of the sisters marries him, and the other one marries his brother. And so I'm working on a, a contemporary version of that um, where the bear is a, just a bear. He's a grizzly bear. Um, that's it. There's two sisters, and there's a, there's a bear. And one of them is really into the bear. That's it. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> that is happening. It's happening so hard. Is it Bear Week? No. Uh, I had to. Dad jokes in Provincetown. Um, that sounds amazing and a, a real departure. Well, there's, you know, there's a bear through line. There's a bear in this book too. Uh, it is a real through line in that. Uh, sorry, it's a real departure in that the. This is now the fourth manuscript I'm working on, fourth novel manuscript I'm working on, and I hope it will be the second published book. I started a project, I worked on a project for a long time, put it in a drawer, started this book, wrote it, I was like, now I know how to write a novel, I got this. Started a third book for various reasons. That is now, I wouldn't say in a drawer, but like sitting atop the desk. This one I was like, let's just keep it, keep it clean. I got, I got really in my head for a long time, I got really, up in the clouds, I was like, there's a girl, there's a sister, and there's a fucking bear. <laughs> like, let's do this thing. I'm loving it. I love, I love that also as a, I'm not writing about a bear, but now I kind of want to. Um, no, I do, I love the research bears. The research is just watching bear movies. There is a juvenile bear in our backyard recently. Um, that's real. That's not a bit. Uh, I am working, well, I was working, am I still working maybe on this project, which is a series of prose poems uh, positing a speculative near future anarchist queer utopian Western mass that sort of seceded. Um, there's no characters. Um, so that may become a novel. Um, inverse? It's not inverse. It's close yeah. It's as a poet, I seem to like chunks of text. Um, thank you for that, yeah. Yeah, prose poetry is also prose. Um, so yeah, I don't know, the pandemic and the, you know, the endemic, do we, do we give that an article? The, um, the historical moment we're in changed what uh, near future was meaning. And so the manuscript is sort of like, I'm, I'm sort of struggling there to, to um, find my relationship to the near future. I'm really interested in imagining the world I wanna live in, um, but that has gotten harder. And in some ways it's gotten harder because of the, the amazing kind of people's movements that have been rising up in the last few years um, and the wonderful sort of real world examples of mutual aid and, and care work and like anti-capitalist organizing, it sort of feels like, oh, so much is happening. And then also it's gotten difficult because of the sort of like despair inducing um, battery of the news as we all know, right? So I think, um, yeah, I've been struggling with staying connected to that project. I've got some other projects, but I'm also having that like, yeah, I'm not gonna say anything about them because I don't wanna yeah. lose the magic, if that makes sense. Um, but I'm, I'm sort of, I'm thinking about cheating on that book. <laughs> What are you both reading that inspires you right now? I'm actually reading a, a book right now by a former Fock fellow that is like unbelievably extraordinary, rich, and superb. And I cannot uh, pronounce her name, so I'm gonna give it my best go. The book is called The End of Drum Time, and the, her name is Hannah Pumping. P Pilvinin. Anyway, the book's called The End of Drum Time. And uh, it's a novel, and it's about reindeer herders in the 1850s in the, the Finland-Sweden border. And it is 
very like dense with description of reindeer ankles and I'm like absolutely loving it. I'm actually Liz, I think you would really love it. I think you would love it. Uh, it's it's really extraordinary. I also uh, on the other I guess another novel I read recently that I can't stop thinking about is a book called A Little Rabbit by Alyssa Song Seriday. Folks read that? So good. I can't stop talking about this book, which I read in the spring. Um, it's prob it's about sex and it's about making art. And I imagine that might be relevant to some or all of us at this P Town art week, you know? Um, it's, it's just like a very, very exciting, sensual, uh, desirous story of, of a kind of 30-year-old artist who goes, who is overtaken by passion uh, and lust, and how that lust then kind of unlocks things in herself, in, in her art that she didn't know about before. It's really good, little rabbit, pink cover. I, I love a pink cover. I also like a pink cover. Um, I am, gosh, reading, I've just been kind of glutted with reading lately and it's been thrilling. And a couple of things popped to mind, but I would say that the book that's been most um, ah, shattering or affecting for me in the last year, I'm about to, I'm about to reread it, is Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future which I sort of feel like, just don't read anything else, just everybody go read that. <laughs> like I actually, I used to feel very strongly that if I could get everybody in the world to read The Dispossessed, Ursula K. Le Guin's The Dispossessed, I would feel like my time on earth would be well spent. But now I feel like what we actually just need to do is everybody needs to read Ministry for the Future as soon as possible so that we can like make it so. Um, and I think, yeah, that's sort of where my head is at. I just read a really um, lovely and, and delightful novel called Body Grammar by Jules Omen. Yeah, that was great. I just got it in the mail and read it in a day, and I thought, this is it. <laughs> you know that feeling of reading that you had as a kid where you're just like, I just read the book. Yeah. It was a great book. I went to that world. And I left it and I was like, where's my next book? Um, the other book that I'm super excited about right now, and I've just started, but then I left it at home, kicking myself, is Mecca Jamila Sullivan's first novel, which just maybe came out this week or is coming out next week. It's called Big Girl, and it is gonna rock your world. It's so good. And um, Mecca's first short story collection, Blue Talk and Love, is sort of this um, virtuosic collection of everything from historical fiction, fabulism, um, literary realism, very smart, political, lyrical, gorgeous, black queer femme writing. She's so wonderful. And to get a full novel from her feels like, oh, this is really what I've been waiting for. So that's the one I'm probably most excited about finishing. So do you have other questions? <laughs> yeah, that's great. Thank you so much. You. Awesome. Thank you, Julia and Andrea. Um,